good to see everybody today. Uh, we'll get started here, and uh, we won't we won't take too long as far as you know getting into into the lunch hour and everything. Um, but uh, this is an, an important topic that we're going to discuss here. It's going to build on what David spoke on um, uh, last message, last service. And uh, we're going to answer the question or start continuing to build on what happened here at Granville. What, what is happening to our church? Um, talk to a number of you after, after uh, David's message. I know that that question is out there. And uh, we will work with the council. We're meeting with them tomorrow night to where that is clearly communicated uh, moving forward. But let's look at a process of what happened here at Granville. And how do we get along together here? How do we interact with each other here? Um, What are some of the contributing factors to where Granville is today as a church? David mentioned when he was speaking we love you in the Lord. And we serve with IBL because we love God's church. We love God's people. We love God's word. And these are all principles that are found uh, in God's word. It's not David and Keith say. It, it's not uh, David and Keith have all the answers. IBL has all the answers. They're perfect. But these are godly principles um, for us as we, as we move forward. We're nothing special. I was an administrative pastor uh, over outside of Milwaukee at a church for nine years. And uh, we experienced challenges there. We're not not perfect. Um, We are flesh and blood, just like you guys. So we're gonna be in a number of passages today. Uh, for this, uh, the next 30 or 40 minutes here, we're going to be in Galatians 5, we're going to be in Ephesians 4, we're going to take a look at 1 John, so uh, let's, uh, let's get started here. We're, um, as we look at these passages, we want to make application from what we're reading here today in God's Word to the situation you find yourself in here at Granville, and as we read these passages, as, as we go through these biblical concepts Please remember to look at God's desire, God's desire for you, God's desire for the church here at Granville. Um, And we're also going to see, so we want to look at God's desires, and we're also going to see in these passages, unfortunately, the frequent reality of how we handle situations, how we get along together. Um, So let's read Galatians 5. 7 through 10 to start, if you want to, if you want to turn there um, and follow along. Galatians 5, 7 through 10. You were running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. So we see here, we see the Galatian Christians, and they had started running the race of the Christian life well, but somebody had cut cut in on them, somebody got involved in their lives and caused them to break stride and stumble. There were unbiblical teachings that they had allowed that were initially only accepted by a few of the Galatian churches, but then that quickly spread uh, as we read this passage. Now let's move down to Galatians 5, 13 through 26. We'll read starting verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are, these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, 
envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So what are we reminded about in this passage? We're reminded that we are free. What are we free from? We are free from sin. We are free from guilt. We are free from trying to be good. But do we abuse this freedom at times? I know there are times that I do. Yeah, we abuse this freedom at times. There are opportunities in our life that we have a choice on how we're going to respond, and we take the opportunity to live in the flesh. Because the thought is, God, you know what? I'll be forgiven. God will always forgive us. But Christian freedom is not permission for us to do wrong. It is freedom to do right. And this freedom shows itself in love and service to others. We're going we're to dig into that this morning a little bit. So why do we study Galatians 5 when we're looking at, at Granville and the situation that you find, find yourself in here at Granville? I mentioned a little earlier, earlier we we're going to look at how God's desires for us to get along with each other, the fruit of the Spirit, as we see in Galatians 5, and 23. We're going to look at that versus the fact that too often the reality of our life more closely reflects the works of the flesh. So what's been going on here at Granville? The past few years have been challenging ones here in the life of the church. Um, as we just read through the works of the flesh, you are not struggling through all the works of the flesh that are listed, but you are struggling with many of them. As, as David and I have worked with you, your leadership, as we've talked to the congregation, um, you're struggling with many of them. Some of those are enmity, strife, and we'll look at, we'll look at these uh, here, here in a few minutes, what they are exactly. Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. These have been things that have been a challenge here at Granville. And so there have been struggles as a church with some of these aspects. And there may, you, as an individual, you may have some of these, you may be struggling with some of these as an individual. There's been a difference in opinion between individuals. There's been contention. There's been sinful disagreements by individuals. More than half of the works of the flesh listed here indicate different forms of possible conflict among people. And here at Granville, there has been conflict amongst the congregation, amongst law, uh, leadership. But in grace and love this morning, in grace and love today, we want to confront you with these struggles that you've been experiencing, both corporately as a church and as individuals. So let's go back to Galatians 5 and verse 22. We see God's desire for us, that we walk in the Spirit that as a church we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit that reflects Christ and brings God glory. Verse 22 again, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This list is a little different than the list of the works of the flesh, isn't it? Pretty, pretty, big, pretty big difference there. The list in verse 22 describes the desires and characteristics that God nurtures in believers through his living presence. Now keep your finger in Galatians 5. We're going to come back there, but I want to take a look at Ephesians 4 here for the next few minutes. And there were aspects of this that David, uh, David reviewed a few weeks ago when he spoke, uh, when we were with you on unity. I just want to do a review here on a, a few aspects of this. And so we're going to look at how we develop and maintain biblical unity with the church. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, 
with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, as Christians, our conduct concerns both our personal life and our responsibility to other believers in the church. You each have a responsibility to the, to the rest of the church family here at Granville. As believers, our attitudes are important. You know, we want to have a good attitude. And here in Ephesians 4, Paul lists three virtues that are to enhance a believer's walk. The first one that we see here, humility. It's listed first because of Paul's emphasis on unity. What does pride promote? Pride promotes disunity. Humility promotes unity. Concern for peace will mean that Christians will lovingly tolerate each other even when they have differences. We're all wired differently. We do things that drive each other crazy. You know, as David mentioned, the stupid thing that I did on the plane, um, you know, that drove him crazy. Not really. But um, we do things that make us not want to tolerate each other. But we should lovingly tolerate each other even when we have differences. How patient would we be if we really understood or really thought about how incredibly patient God has been with us. If we really understood that, how patient would we be with others if we really understood how incredibly patient God has been with us? Um, Would you put up with yourself if you were God with some of the things that you do and the different ways that you interact with others? Oh, that would be interesting. It's an interesting thought. But in light of what he's done for us, in light of how long he continues to put up with us, we must be those who are patient with others. We must be those who extend mercy and grace freely. And unity can only exist because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Attitudes of humility, gentleness, and patience foster unity among Christians. Now, as we continue on in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, we find things that should unite us as a body of Christ, as believers, as Christians. Verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Paul lists here seven elements of unity, And what is that centered on? It's centered on the person, the three persons of the Trinity. We have one body, the universal church. So that's all of us as believers. One spirit, the Holy Spirit who indwells the church. One Lord, this refers to Christ, the head of the church. One faith, the body of truth believed by Christians. One baptism, believers' identification with Christ in his death. So spiritual unity. One God and Father of all, God the Father and his relationship to all believers. So Trinity here is an integral part of the list. The one body of believers is vitalized by one spirit. So all of us as believers, we have one hope. That body is united to its one Lord, Christ, by each member's one act of faith. And its identity with him is depicted by one baptism. One God, the Father, is supreme over all, operative through all, and resides in all. And all seven components are united in the Trinity. But because all of us, we are, we are in this together. We are all recipients of our Father's grace and kindness. There's no room for anybody here at Granville to say, we're better than they are. Or I'm more holy than she is. I'm more holy than he is. There's no room for that. We're all in this together. There's one body. There's one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's no room for the dividing that we've seen, for the splintering, for saying we're more spiritual than you. No, we shouldn't be saying that. We are to walk in unity. Since believers, as believers, we belong to one family of God, We must bear with one another. Yeah, we might drive each other crazy from time to time. Might be things that we don't agree with. But we should be united. 
Moving on, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So each of us have different gifts here. Each of you, every single one of you here at Granville has a gift that Christ has given you. And as each believer functions in accord, accord with those gifts that Christ has given you, the body as a whole enjoys unity. The whole body becomes more spiritually mature, becomes more like Jesus Christ. So Christ then, as believers, Christ is the source of a believer's growth and also the aim and goal of, of, of our growth. Each of our, all of us here as we grow to become more Christ-like. We're carefully fitted together as a church body by Christ. And this causes the body of Christ to grow and then build itself up in love. Our goal is to be like Jesus. Jesus did not spend his life hanging out in a temple. Where was he? He was, a, he was, he was out in the world, impacting, impacting the world. Where should Granville be? Shouldn't be, shouldn't be this the strife and the, the division here in the church, you should be reaching the community here in Granville, here in, here in, in Grand Rapids, in this area. Should be impacting the world. The goal of the church is one of maturity to conform to the person of Jesus Christ. I grew up in Colorado, um, and uh, my wife is from uh, Illinois, but she moved to Colorado when she was 13. We met up at Maranatha, and moved back to Colorado, have two girls who are now in college. Um, I grew up camping, loving camping in, uh, in the Rocky Mountains of, of Colorado. My wife, she married into it. And uh, my girls, they, were, they, they all love it now, but they were, you know, they were born into it. We had one of our girls in a tent when she was three months old, uh, camping up at, in Grand Lake, Colorado. But we love campfires. And, uh, or we love having fires in our, in our fireplace um, on a cold night. Now, now that we're down in South Carolina, we're not in Colorado any longer, we're not in Wisconsin any longer, we're down in South Carolina. So the cold nights are fewer, which, uh, which is okay. I'm get, this, even this 40 degree weather, I think my blood is getting thin. I'm getting wimpy when it comes to cold weather. But we love campfires. And we're drawn to a crackling fire in a fireplace on a cold winter night, mainly for two reasons, because it provides both light and it provides warmth. And this is a good example of a perfect combination of truth and love. Truth without love is like the light of a fire without warmth. Love without truth is like the heat of a fire without light. Truth without love makes people cold in the light. And love without truth makes people stumble in the dark. Let, thus we need both. Each of us here at Granville, we, we have a role to play in this. You know, we have, our, we have our bodies and we read about it in Ephesians 4, 16. We have our different joints. Um, you know, we have ligaments, we have tendons. Um, if we did not have that, can you imagine, can you imagine what movement would be like? Um, you know, it could be painful, it would be kind of spastic. The same is true spiritually with your gifts and what each of you can bring to Granville in reaching this community. We need one another as a church family. And the Lord has brought us all together in order that together we may conform to him. And the preservation of unity is a responsibility of God's gifted people in the church. So we see here Paul emphasizing body growth, not self-growth, 
Each individual contributes to this unified growth as he allows his particular gifts to function. You need one another. The church family, you need one another to, to function as a church family. Now let's jump back to Galatians 5 and look at the works of the flesh and some of the, the characteristics of what has gone on here, what we believe has gone on here at Granville and what we've seen. We read earlier verses 19 through 21 and the sins that we see there in those verses can be categorized in the following way. Um, first, we see moral sins, that's sexual immorality, the impurity, sensuality, or lack of restraint. We see worship sins, that's the idolatry and sorcery. So this can be mind-altering drugs, the occult, witchcraft. We then see social conduct sins, drunkenness, orgies, um, probably a specific reference uh, to the orgies that characterized pagan, idolatrous worship of that day, generally it refused to rowdy, boisterous, crude behavior, behavior. So we see about half in these first three of moral worship and social conduct sins. And then the other, the other half that we see are in relational sins, which we're going to dig into here. Now, if we have somebody that's struggling with these sins, normally those first three of the more, if it's a moral worship and social conduct sin, we usually respond right away to those sins. Those are serious sins. We've got to jump on this. We need to get this taken care of. And, you know, we need to go talk to that person. And, um, you know, which if handled correctly, yes, we definitely want to do that. But we usually put the relational sins. We won't address those sins. 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. The Greek tense of this passage makes it clear that we are to cut off from our company not the one who has fallen into or struggles with these sins, right? Each of us has sins that we struggle with, but the one who knowingly, stubbornly, continuously practices these sins. So why do we do this? And we do want to do this, but first to correct the offender. If, if we have a sickness, if we have a tumor in our body um, and we go to the doctor, no competent doctor is going to say, I'm not going to operate on you because I don't want to be too harsh with you. But a lot of times that's, what, that, that's exactly what we do. And we say to believers who are caught up in sin when we fail to take the sword of the spirit and show them where they're wrong. If we really care about someone, we'll say, I'm not going to fellowship with you, not because I'm mad at you or don't love you. It should be, on the contrary, I care about you so much that I cannot allow you to go on as though there's nothing wrong in your life. Because sooner or later, the tumor of sin within you will take a terrible toll on you. So first, we do respond quickly to correct the offender, but why do we not do that with the relational sins? Secondly, we are not to fellowship with those determined to sin in order to protect the body. We begin to think like and talk like those with whom we spend time. We assume, if you want to say, we assume the flavor of those around us and those that we, we hang out with, those who we talk to. So Paul tells us here in this passage, we are not to hang out around those who are consistently, persistently covetous, drunkards, idolaters, or fornicators. So we don't want to associate with these people. We respond quickly when it's one, one of those sins. But we tolerate the relational sins in our midst. And a lot of times, we're right in the middle of it. It might be gossip. It might be a number of things going on, and, and we're right in the middle of it. So let's look at these relational sins that we oftentimes let slide and that we tolerate. This can happen, as David mentioned uh, in his message this morning, this can happen with the leadership team. This can happen with any individual here at Granville. So relational sins, enmity. What is enmity? Animosity or intense dislike of someone, a feeling of hatred. This is powerful. As Christians, we should not hate anyone. We are to love one another, but we are talking about what is really happening on the ground. 
So maybe not by everybody, but by a few. We see strife. It's a difference in opinion between individuals. Has there been strife here? Has there been a difference of opinion between individuals? Yes, definitely. It's contention, sinful disagreement by individuals. We see jealousy, resenting another's accomplishments or relationships. James 3, 14 through 16 says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly and spiritual demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So jealousy. Jealousy is a clear indicator that one's so-called wisdom is not from above, but is earthly and unspiritual. And what does this produce? This produces disorder. This produces confusion. There is some confusion in the congregation here today. What's going on? Where have we been? Where are we going? What's, you know, we're not clear. There's fits of anger, outbur- outbursts of rage and anger. Works of the flesh also include rivalries, sinfully organi- organizing into groups according to our differences. You know, we might agree over here, might agree over here, so we, we break up into different groups, we're conspiring against each other, there's gossip and slander and, and fruitless speech, as David mentioned this morning. 2 Corinthians 12.20 says, For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. And the eight sins that Paul mentions here that we read about, they're all seen in church division. And if it's not addressed, it can lead to dissensions. What, is, what, are, what are dissensions? It's the forming of sides. We're setting ourselves in opposition to one another based on our opinions. Again, our opinions and our preferences. We all have preferences. We all have opinions. And so we have disunity. And what does it look like? Well, a lot of times it can look like multiple churches under one church or multiple churches under one roof. So these individuals might be in group A. Some other individuals might be in group B. These individuals over here might be in group C. And we have dissension in the church. Then we have divisions. And at this point, at this point after dissensions, you're ready to slip into divisions. Romans 16, 17 says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. So then we slip. We have, we have, uh, we have dissensions, and we slip into divisions where we go to war with one another. It's open warfare. I'm following my own group, and we're doing our, we're doing our own thing. And there can be Envy where we're, we're, we have a desire or a passion for somebody's position or the influence that they have on, on others. So what does this look like in a church? And we're going we're gonna to progress through this, talk, talk through this for the next few minutes. And this is what we would believe has happened here at Gran- Granville. We at IBL, we would believe that this has happened uh, at Granville through the last couple of years. And... So you guys have the chart, you have the handout in front of you, and it's first broken down in relationships and behaviors, as well as our corporate character qualities and corporate motivations. We don't need to to advance to those quite yet. Um, But as we go through this chart, there can be horizontal progression or there can be vertical progression as we move through this. Um, Sometimes leadership can be participants in relational sin. Um, church members are, are participants in relational sin, uh, but leadership, sometimes they can tolerate it. Sometimes they don't know how to address it biblically. The members of the church can be participants in relational sin. They might not know how to address it biblically. So ask yourself as we look through this chart, just here in the next few minutes, where are you at on this scale both as a church, but more importantly, where are you individually? 
we're, we're not here to point fingers. We're not here to think, oh yeah, that person, this person. Look at it individually. So what does the church look like when we have relational sin within the church? We'll start here at the top, our, our corporate relationships and behaviors. It begins with strife. Again, difference in opinions between individuals. There's contention. There's sinful disagreements. And this can go on for years. You can be in this at this point for years. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, so the top R is relationships. Relationships and unorganized. So if I miss one of those, I'll try to see it back here. If I miss one of those, throw a mint at me or something, or a tootsie roll. You have plenty of those. But it begins with strife. There's a difference in opinion between individuals. There's contention, sinful disagreement by individuals. And again, it can go on for years. And so over a period of years, the strife then progresses into rivalry. So this is again where uh, you're sinfully organizing into groups according to our differences. And you're conspiring against each other. There's gossip, there's slander, there's fruitless speech. Can you guys see those? Did you get those ones? Differences. Differences is the blank. We then see dissension, where we have the forming of sides. We are setting ourselves in opposition to one another based on our opinions and our preferences. And this is where we would have the multiple churches under one roof. That is crystallized. The blank there is crystallized. Let me see this real quick. Make sure I know what blanks you guys need. But this is the multiple churches under one roof, the dissension. And then we have division, going to war with one another, open warfare. I'm following my own group. I'm doing my own thing. All of which include conspiratorial activity or behavior such as gossip and slander. That last, uh, that last blank there is warfare, open warfare under division. Some of you have been talking about others. You know, about what's going on and what this person did, what that person is doing or isn't doing. There are rivalries, there's dissension, there's division. And that happens out of these conversations that never should have happened, happen. So, can you progress that one more, please? That blank there is cons conspiratorial activity. And that's where gossip comes in. That is where the gossip and the slander comes in. And you see that that gossip behavior is what progresses you in those three stages. The three stages of rivalry, dissension, and division. We then see the corporate character qualities. And that's what that blank is there, character qualities. Do you have enmity, jealousy, envy, covetousness in the life of the church, in your life? Some have taken these sinful character qualities on instead of the fruit of the spirit. Here at church, you might look pretty, you know, when you're, when you're out in front of everybody but who are you when no one else is in the room? What is in your heart? And if we can, if we can advance that. Our corporate motivations. And what is in your heart? Is it fleshly desires and selfish ambition? Do you want what you want? These come out of our motivations. 
this whole process here, it could be driven by a few individuals. It usually only takes a few people that come together and start gathering support. And then the sheep will slowly start to, to participate and follow and sinfully participate. And this is what systemic organizational conflict looks like. And this is what has happened to your church here at Granville. As time goes on, this might have started slowly, but as time goes on, this process speeds up. It's very damaging to Christ's name. It's very damaging to Christ's name in here in the church. It's very damaging to Christ's name here in the community. Granville should be about the great commission and great commandment, making disciples, loving God and loving others, and being unified. So what in the world do we do about, about this? You know, we'll build on this tonight, but we'll, we'll look at a few aspects of this right now. What do we do about this? We find ourselves here, um, you know, in dissension, with division. So what do we do? We have a choice. Galatians 5.15 says, But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So every time we want to talk about someone, every time we want to put somebody down, every time we want to make a snide remark, every time we, you know, or rolled our eyes in response to someone else, sooner or later, we're going to be hurt to the same degree. Scripture says flat out, straight on, with great clarity, that if you bite and devour, take heed, you will be consumed by another. Thank you. And this is pretty serious. And this is, this is so serious that if we look at this, when you look at the imagery of this passage here in Galatians 5, the imagery is of wild anim animals savagely attacking and killing each other. A graphic picture of what happens in the spiritual realm when believers do not love and serve each other. So we have that Im imagery there of how serious this is. So our choice, be devoured by one another. And there's been some of that going on, devouring of one another. Or we can lovingly serve one another, which it means we don't follow our fleshly desires. We don't follow our selfish, selfish ambitions. Galatians 5.13 again, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So serve one another. Be there for each other. Pour yourself into people. Get involved into talking with others and, and, and encouraging them and, and, and helping them become more Christ-like in the struggles that they have. A lot of times if you, if you um, interact with people in that manner, you'll find that talking with them about the eternal issues will be more exciting and thrilling than than any of this other stuff that's going on and getting into those and the gossip and the slander and just what a heavy burden that becomes. Get involved in the things of the kingdom. How is this possible? This is possible because Jesus has shown the way and gives his spirit to help us. We are free not to break the law, but to keep it. So now we can at least obey God in the right way and for the right reasons. So Granville has a choice here. You can continue to consume each other. You can continue to be divided. We've seen it before. We've seen examples of this before. And who knows where the church ends up. The community will not be reached. Shame, you will bring shame on the kingdom of God. Or 
you lovingly serve one another? So how do you go from where you are to lovingly serving each other? And love is a motivation for our behavior, for this type of behavior. Ephesians 4 that we, that we looked at, love is mentioned three times. You're bearing with one another, you're speaking the truth in love, and growing itself in love. So let's look at John 13, 34 through 35. This is the last passage we'll look at this morning. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the standard for our relationships with each other, Christ's love for, for me. So we see here in this passage, we see that it, it's dark, but even though it was dark, Jesus said to his disciples, this is the hour of glory. I'm going to be leaving, and where I'm going, you can't come right now. So in the meantime, I'm giving you a new, a new commandment to love one another. A new commandment? Doesn't it say way back in Leviticus that we are to love God and that we are to love our neighbors? Isn't that the message, really, of the scriptures in their entirety? What does he mean, a new commandment? Let's look carefully at what Jesus is saying here. And yes, we see in the Old Testament, we see it's, it's filled with commandments, it's filled with exhortations to love. But Jesus here says, love one another as I have loved you. So how, how did Jesus love them? How does Jesus love us? That's what's new. Paul tells us how he loves us when he writes, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So this is new. This is a, a new way of thinking. The newness, the unfolding, the fullness of this new commandment is that we are to love in a way that costs us our life, not just loving generally, but loving sacrificially to the place of death. So what does that look like? Let's look at that. Biblically, there's never true reconciliation apart from someone or something dying. In the Old Testament, reconciliation was impossible without the sacrifice of an animal. But in the New Testament, it was the death of the innocent Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. So here, in the, in the, in the, in the life of Granville, there will never be true reconciliation between, between you and the person with who you're angry with or who you're cut off from until you say, I'm not going to grind my axe any longer with what's been going on. I'm not going to press my point any further. I'm not going to prove that I'm the right one here anymore. I'm just going to die. But the question is, will you? Or will those selfish ambitions rise up again? You say, I'm innocent. I'm innocent in all of this. I had no part of this. Well, so was Jesus. Jesus was innocent. You say, I am right. Wasn't he? He was right. The commandment he gave us is to die. And every single one of us in here should be dying to our pride, to our complaints that we have about what's going on, to our position that we have, to our proof that we might have. When we love like Jesus, some will respond to that and there will be reconciliation. Praise the Lord. That is, that is what we want to see. That's what we are praying for, reconciliation. Others will continue to say, nope, they'll, they'll still be fighting for their position and their selfish ambition and, and the desires. Um, uh, even, you know, just like they were doing to Jesus as he was in, you know, as he was dying for, for their sins and they were mocking him. But if we are to love as Jesus loved, like him, we'll pray, Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they're doing. By this kind of love shall all men know you are my disciples, said Jesus. When you love like I do, when you love to the point of death. So if God so loved us and keeps on loving us, then we have no other recourse but to forgive people who have knowingly or unknowingly offended us. A lot of, a lot of you in here, you've been offended and you know it. A lot of people might unknowingly know that you not know that they have offended if you're having a hard time forgiving someone ask the lord to give you a glimpse of your own sin 
and a peek at how much he has forgiven you. So ask yourself, with what's been going on here at Granville, what part do you have or have you played in this conflict? Where have you been wrong? What would God have you let go of in this? Don't clothe yourself in self-righteousness. Say, I've not had any part in this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not responsible, responsible. Ask the Spirit to show you what you've done wrong. And so in closing, we're going to close this time. Here's a question that we want you to consider. In what ways have I allowed a pattern of relational sin to creep into my own life? And what would God have me to do? And we would ask that you continue to reflect on, on, on these biblical principles that we have looked at today. I know there's been a lot you know, between David's message and this time right now. But continue to reflect on the biblical principles that we've looked at today. And ask the Holy Spirit to highlight the mistakes that you've, that you've made and the role that you've played in this. Have you initiated a divisive spirit? What type of gossip and malicious talk have you participated in? Maybe, as David mentioned, maybe it was just listening to gossip. This must stop or Granville will be devoured. And this must stop in both the congregation and leadership. There needs to be repentance and forgiveness, reconciliation. Turn away from this behavior and seek forgiveness with each other. God's forgiveness and others' forgiveness. Any closing thoughts before I close in prayer? Or Keith's going to close us here, and Keith's going to close us here in just a minute. I just want to add one thing to what Keith has has presented to us. So this is what's happened here at Granville. Now, in your mind, some of you are going to be saying, "Well, yeah, but okay, so that that happened, but but this person did this." And that caused all sorts of things. So really, it's that person who got this going. Keith and I want to tell you, don't do that. Do not go there, because that's a fool's errand. To walk back, to try to walk back to all the chaos, because in this diagram is a lot of sinful chaos, a lot of tit-for-tatting going on. Is that a phrase you guys know, tit-for-tat? You do this, I'm going to do that they do that we're going to do this it's a fool's errand to try to go back and say this person that person's behavior started the ball rolling you can never do it so don't even try what can you do you can look at your own behavior you can look at your own heart that is what must be done and so that's what we encourage you to do. God, what role have I played in this? And then to take the journey of conviction, repentance, confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation. And we'll talk about that this evening as we gather together again. So Keith, why don't you come? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come to your house. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we do pray for Granville. And uh, Lord, that they would be a light in this community. Um, Lord, that, uh, that they would look inside themselves, Lord, and see what role they may have played in this, Lord, and, and that forgiveness would be granted, reconciliation. And um, Lord, we just pray that you would bless this ministry, the leadership, the congregation, moving forward and uh, Lord we pray that everyone everyone would have a good afternoon uh, before returning tonight and uh, we look forward to being in your word again tonight in Jesus name amen